briefing underway. Uh, a quick review of the charts and then we'll get straight to some latest kind of analysis around the UK election. Obviously today marking the final day of campaigning for the election process before we go to the voting booths on Thursday. Uh, but looking at the charts this morning, uh, very much a reflection really of what we've had throughout the week. It's pretty quiet out there overall. Um, just given the gravity of what's being coined as Super Thursday, because it's not just UK Election Day, we also get the ECB interest rate decision, which will be very important, just given some of the hints that we'd like to hear, some subtle changes in their communication about forward-looking policy. Uh, and then we've also got James Comey, the FBI director, having a Senate hearing, a testimony in fact, uh, which of course was one of the key focal points just a few weeks ago when rumours about Trump impeachment and so forth were at their uh, kind of circulating in the marketplace and caused a brief bout of volatility. Uh, but just looking what we got here, cable, a little bit of pressure at the moment. We're just printing, you can see here, fresh intraday lows. So we've seen a slight move below 129 this morning, but I guess when you look at it in the context of its range, I, I can't really see cable doing a great deal at this point, so close now into uh, the actual voting day itself. If anything, it's been just consolidation with the actual moves just getting smaller, if anything. Um, we're going to talk about the election a bit more detail, so not going to go into that too much at this point. Uh, but looking at the overall performance of the major FX pairs, looks to be, if anything, quiet conditions, maybe a bit of dollar strength, the dollar index just um, moving above its Asia Pacific highs. So both pairs seeing a bit of downward weight. It's not just cable, uh, euro dollar also. Uh, seeing a move straight down to S1 this morning when the volume started to pick up as European participants started to come in. And looking at euro dollar, I guess in context here, you've got the upside. I think that's still a pretty decent level, just given the fact that the ECB looming with their rate decision tomorrow. I doubt many market participants would want to step in at this particular point ahead of that big event, uh, given the fact that we are expecting some changes in their language. Uh, and on the downside, there's a couple of levels, obviously, to look out for. Uh, yesterday's low print at 112.47 in Euro futures. Uh, and then you've also got the Monday level down at 41.5. Um, and then going down to S2 would be really a full reversal then of the Euro dollar spike up that we saw chiefly led by the, the spike lower in the dollar on the dismal non-farms report we had on Friday. Uh, Equity-wise, very quiet in the US. Uh, if I put it on a slightly longer dated time frame here, uh, this was that kind of impeachment talk we just briefly said uh, at that point of when people were suggesting uh, inappropriate relationships and intervention of the Russians in the election process in the US. Uh, that selling though very short lived and actually we punched all the way up to all time highs. Uh, but really after hitting that all time high uh, just about a week ago, it's very much just consolidation now uh, ahead of these big or bigger risk events. Uh, if you're looking at the actual range here that we've been trading, it's about 0.55%. So it's relatively small. The interesting thing here is if I mark up this previous point here is that we had this quite strong level of resistance in the S&P future, just above that 2400 level. You had that double top, the eventual break. When that happened, we then went into consolidation for about a week before then the next trigger uh, with a move on the upside and again, consolidation phase. Uh, it seems to be a, a bit of a pattern that's formulating at the moment. Just quite interesting though, these last two periods of consolidation have both been pretty much exactly the same size in terms of the range trade of about just over 0.5 of 1%. Um, but looking this morning, it's pretty quiet there. Uh, likewise, the open in the DAX as well. Uh, not a great deal going on at this point. So let's just get straight into the UK election then. There's a couple of interesting charts that I've got to show you this morning because bank research is all rolling out this morning ahead of the, the big event. Um, one of the first questions is where would the pound go under different scenarios and outcomes of the UK election? 
And so quite a, quite a good summary graphic here. These are forecasts from a variety of different banks. So ABN AMRO, uh, Bank of New York Mellon, RBC, Saxo Bank, SEB, Nomura. So a collection of different banks and basically taking the median of what they're looking for under four different election scenarios. So conservatives win with a large majority, uh, conservative win with a small majority, a hung parliament or a Labour win. Uh, and it's just quite interesting to give yourself uh, a reference point then when you're trading so that if we do go, remember when I, what I always say when trading these big kind of fundamental events, it's about scenario building ahead of time. You know, whatever your political belief, kind of put it to the side. You've just got to go on the probabilities and how the market is positioned and how it might react in the different scenarios. Then it's just about execution rather than having to kind of think on your feet so much, which is obviously going to take time because when trading the news, speed is of the essence. So this can act as, as a pretty good barometer of where the, the currency might go. And if I just, let's have a look at these numbers and let's have a look at our cable chart here. Might put it in some, to some greater context. Uh, you'll have to excuse the text on this cable chart. I've had it on there for quite a while. Uh, but it might help to, to tell a bit more of a story of where we were trading at those year-to-date highs at the period of the polling booth closing at 10 p.m. on the night of the EU referendum before, obviously, uh, that big downfall. But let's look at Conservatives win a large majority. The median consensus of these surveyed banks conducted by Bloomberg would be for a move back up to 131. So that's kind of looking up to this level here where we are at the moment. Well, I'm just marking up here on the side roughly. Uh, so you're looking at about uh, a three-point move. I would say that's pretty, pretty realistic. Certainly, I'd be looking for a retest of the recent and multi-month highs uh, at 130.59 because at this point, the polls certainly have narrowed. So the likelihood of an outright large majority has diminished, but the fact that we're still trading a 129 handle means that the market is still fairly confident in terms of the way it's positioned, at least, that the Conservatives will uh, maintain, if not add to their slim majority of 17 at this point. On a small majority, uh, these banks are looking at a move uh, to just sub kind of a retest of these levels we just marked up. On a hung parliament, that's probably the most negative scenario and these what we're looking at here let me just flick over so you can see here of the four situations this by far has the most impact a hung parliament that's because generally speaking forming of coalitions under a hung parliament situation takes time and given the fact that we already triggered article 50 at the end of march time is something we do not have at this point because as we know the timelines of negotiating a Brexit in a two-year horizon is incredibly difficult. Um, and so the transitional deal is key to getting that done. And so hence the reason why you'd have such a negative shock. Uh, these estimates that we're looking at here are what the banks are looking at as a median consensus for the daily move. This isn't the overall outcome that you're going to get in weeks beyond, because I actually think that's pretty reasonable, I'd say, under a hung parliament to move back down to 123.50, just kind of the, uh, you can see here technically a, a level that has provided some significance before. But beyond that, I would imagine we'd go down to test the lower bound of this actual broader trading range at 120. Uh, because of the timeline, the implication it would have on forming the coalition on the Brexit process. A Labour win still negative because that's against what the market is expecting and priced and the median consensus then is for a move down to around 124.84 so we're looking at around this point here so again quite useful uh, i'd put it in the chat room to have an idea of how the market might react a few other things then to be aware of <clears throat> obviously as you know the way the the polls work in the uk booths are going to open at 7 a.m they're going to close at 10 p.m. Now, the interesting thing here, if you were looking back to 2015, 
is that trading the 2015 election was pretty much over within about 15 minutes. That's because 2015, the pollsters predicted a hung parliament and what we got was more indicative of a Tory majority. And in fact, the exit poll even underestimated the Tories and they ended up having an even bigger margin in the end. So just to confirm, at 10 p.m. Ipsos Mori, which is one of the main uh, pollsters, will publish an official exit poll, which will then be run by the BBC and Sky News immediately at 10 p.m. So literally to the second, the exit poll will come out and it will have a definitive calculation as well of seats. So you should know pretty quickly whether you're going to be in for an early night or a v or you're not going to have any sleep that night essentially is how it's going to play out um, the reason why the exit polls carry so much impact on the market is because historically the exit polls have proven to be extremely accurate going off previous precedents of of historical elections uh, the vote, obviously, the counting starts at 10 p.m. The actual official results start coming at around 11 p.m. and into midnight. Now, that leads on to some other questions that people have often asked me is, what time do I need to be trading this event? So really, a key point of time, of course, is the exit poll at 10. On balance, the broader market expectation is by that point, it's probably going to reflect a Tory majority. This isn't my view. This is... A reflection of the way the market is priced at this point with sterling still trading higher if that is not the case and it's an inconclusive exit poll we then go into monitoring all of the 650 constituents as we go through the night question mark then is at what point during the night will we know the eventual result as you know if you traded the US election because all of the swing states were situated on the east or northeast coast of America and given the time zones across America, really California was a non-event because at that point, the time difference meant they came so much later than the key swing states like Florida, North South Carolina, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, and so on and so forth. So if you know all of those already, then the market, remember, prices on future expectation, it will already conclude uh, the end result. So the key area here, as you can see by this graph, is that in total, there's 650 constituencies we are to hear from or to declare their results. And there's a peak of, it, of those coming out at 3 o'clock and then also 4 o'clock. And actually, by the time we get to between 4 a.m. and 4.30 a.m., should we go into this monitoring of individual councils scenario, you should have just over 50% of the results have come in and you should already by 4, 4.30 a.m. already know what the situation is, i.e. the market would have already traded to either it's declined and it's a hung parliament or it's rallied and it's a massive Tory majority, whatever the situation might be. So really the period between 4.30 to 7 a.m. or after is a formality at that point. So if you're going to trade the event, really, you're going to have to trade it all the way through, if it gets down to it, till probably around uh, 4.30 a.m., I would say. If it's very close, obviously, then it continues. If there's a number of constituents that are very close in the actual count and the overall election is very close as a whole, you could go into, hypothetically, a process of recounts, and that could extend the entire process all the way out through the morning. But in 2015, it was before 6 a.m. when David Cameron already came out and declared victory well in advance of all the other. Um, at that point, mathematically, he had already acquired enough seats, so to speak. OK, a few other things to, to have a look at here. Now, this is very interesting. Two real ways we were looking at this briefly yesterday to kind of determine then which are the constituents that you need to monitor because it's going to be pretty impossible to monitor all 650 and really some of them are very stronghold Labour, some of them are very stronghold Conservatives so in that point of view there's no point really focusing on the strongholds what's going to tip the balance is going to be the ones that will be deemed potential swing states or swing areas so what I've got here is a, is a table compiled by Deutsche Bank 
and they're looking at marginal seats from the previous election. Uh, marginal is defined here by a majority of 5% or less. Now you've got the winners on the left, so you can see here Berry North, for example, uh, is Conservative, Labour was second, but Conservatives only won by 378 votes. That equates percentage-wise to 0.8%. Now the reason why I really like this Deutsche table is because this is identifying then marginal seats or potential swing areas by chronological order, as you can see on the right. So if you were going for a checklist of potential swing areas, obviously they've already done the hard work for you if you like and they've categorized it by timeline. So it's going to be really from two o'clock when things start to get very interesting. And we go through scaling down. Some are obviously more winnable or more changeable from political backing than others. So for instance, Peterborough is 4.1% conservative, where if you go down to uh, Ealing Central and Acton in London, it's 0.5% to Labour. So it's very much on the balance. We scroll down then in this report. This is the second interesting, or really interesting table. This is Labour seats that are vulnerable, and this is overlaying it with the Brexit vote. And now, we, we discussed this again yesterday, but to recap for those if you missed it, what we're looking at here is areas in the UK that were very heavily in favour of Brexit. What you'll see here is a number of these are northeast of England, which quite typically would be strong labour or safe labour seats. The only problem that you have is that um, some of the areas, like Warsaw North, for example, they had a they had a labour majority of 5.3 percent, but they voted 75% almost for Brexit. And so this is another key way of looking at the key target seats here. Now, if you were the Conservative Party or part of the campaign team, where do you think Theresa May and the Conservative Party will be focusing um, the, the, the campaign trail? All of these towns, pretty much. And if we go over to this chart, this is what this is reflecting. This is May's target labor levers. So what you're looking at here is a matrix of the horizontal line. So being above that are areas that voted to leave the EU, below voted to remain. And then to the left, labor majority, the more further to the left, the more stronger labor, further to the right, the more stronger Tory. Now what you can see here is interesting because there's obviously a cluster of campaign focus from the Conservatives within the upper left quartile. What this is telling you is that, as you can see here, it's even more clustered around the centre line, meaning that the areas that are currently Labour, but only by a very small proportion, and the ones that are further up are more heavily um, were voted for Brexit. So if anything, you would say then that these are potentially key ones to look out for and the Conservatives have definitely uh, been their strategy in order to use the Brexit as the chief argument to cultivate the kind of sentiment, if you like, in order to flip these minor Labour states into Conservative. Another interesting uh, graphic that I had here actually as part of this one is looking at when you talk about UKIP we talk about UKIP a lot because UKIP's performance in this upcoming election is going to be abysmal but in 2015 they were actually very well supported and you could say um, this whole kind of uh, sentiment of Brexit in order to push it over the line was really cultivated by Nigel Farage and UKIP to some, uh, to some extent. And what we're looking at here is a very interesting prospect because just looking at some of the analysis this morning of what Bloomberg have been talking about, they suggest that if Theresa May wins just 50%, so if she wins half of the UKIP vote from t two years ago, 
as well as being able to capture 2% of Labour's vote, that will win a total of 41 more seats on top of the 17 already. So then you start talking about 50, 60 seat, uh, a fairly comfortable majority for the Conservatives. So this is based on the fact that she captures just half of the UKIP vote, where I, I guess consensus belief would be that that's going to be on balance. You would imagine most UKIP supporters who are kind of called to arms over the issue of immigration, very much pushed by Nigel Farage, would vote much more toward Brexit. Hence the reason why yesterday you're probably hearing the, the speech from Theresa May talking about uh, changing of some of the rules in regards to uh, foreign policy and, and so on. So a couple of interesting thoughts here. Obviously today is the final day of campaigning. So I would imagine a late flutter of politicians speaking throughout the day. I don't think they've really got much to, to move the market at this point. Uh, one thing to be aware of though is that Kantar Ipsos Mori, Panelbase, Comres, ICM, YouGov, they are all releasing their final polls today. Um, again, I don't think this is really going to be a tradable event, not unless it shows Labour in the lead, because really that hasn't happened. The average poll of polls would still be on a seven percentage point clearance, if you like, of a, la of a Conservative lead over the Labour Party, despite this wide uh, kind of divergence between the different pollsters. Okay, quickly then moving on to some other headlines so you are aware. Obviously this week isn't just about the ECB and it's not just about the UK election. There is the small matter of has Donald Trump illegally uh, used illegitimate online activities in relations to the Russians in order to boost his chance of becoming US president, or as Saif would say, the leader of the free world. Um, so James Comey, obviously a name you're familiar with now, is the former FBI director, and a lot of people have been waiting until Thursday because he's going to be appearing in a testimony before the US Senate. A lot of people obviously a bit nervous about what credible evidence does he have to suggest then that you know, in retaliation to Trump firing him after he was investigating Trump himself over his connections with Russia, what could Comey come out with in order to, um, to bring to light new material? But there was a headline that came out last night and actually helped the US equities recover from their worst levels because reports suggest that James Comey said to stop short of saying whether Trump obstructed justice. So the ex-FBI chief will share details of the conversations with the president, um, but is going to stop short saying that he obstructed justice, which overall means then that the, the kind of tail risk, the most biggest volatility event that could occur, has probably been mitigated by this comment which came out last night. It means that Comey's probably going to play it safe and not disrupt uh, the president's process even further. Um, don't forget, Trump at this point, we've been so focused on the UK election. Once that moves, let's say if it is a Tory majority, um, then obviously at this point Trump still hasn't really done a great deal on the fiscal side. Details about the corp phenomenal corporate tax deal is still pretty much a one-page doc that hasn't really had much discussion on Capitol Hill as yet. You've still got repeal of Obamacare, you've still got the infrastructure programs. There's a lot to be done. And so the reason why this Comey hearing is important is because does it delay that process? But this comment from last night would suggest that that's not going to be the case. Okay, a few other headlines to be aware of. Australian GDP last night, if you look at your Aussie futures chart ticker, DA6, if you're looking at the futures. Uh, we had a little bit of Aussie strength overnight. You've had the Australian GDP coming in in positive territory, 0.3%. Uh, I believe the market was looking for 02 so a touch stronger than expected. Uh, you have had German factory orders this morning, which declined 2.1%. Uh, 
the market was actually expecting a, a drop of just 0.4%, so a little bit weaker than expected. But overall, the market's not really paying too much attention to that data. German factory orders in particular tend to be an extremely volatile piece of, of data. Um, just before we conclude, Philippe quite kindly has uh, just updated the chat. Uh, let me just bring up actually uh, Zero Hedge is a good website for obtaining the API crude oil inventories because they actually break down the data uh, with charts and historical numbers as well, so it can often be very useful. Uh, let me just scroll back to when they would have released it. So here we are. So API data last night. Let's have a look at the crude chart first of all and see whether it had any type of market impact on underlying price. And looking at 9.30, well, you can see this is one of the things that you get used to when you do accumulate more experience is that the charts really tell you a, a bit of a story. And looking at crude, that was 9.30 candle. Obviously, it's moved considerably lower. It's not an outright huge move, uh, but certainly we've, we've traced portion of that gain that was seen uh, in the second half of the US session. So it's telling you that probably it was a bearish report in terms of the APIs. Looking at the numbers, uh, let's have a look. You've got a crude drawdown of 4.62 million, slightly larger actually than expected. Uh, I'm not sure what they've put here, ninth weekly build in a row, so uh, I assume that is a drawdown. It would conflict with what they said there, so I can verify that later. Uh, but it's the gasoline one here that seemingly does jump out. Gasoline was a build of just over 4 million. Uh, expectations were for essentially flat. A draw of 50,000 is, is minimal. So it's the biggest build that we've had in gasoline inventories since the beginning of the year. Uh, so overall perceived to be slightly bearish. This is obviously the, the benchmark of what we'll be expecting for the Department of Energy numbers which will come out later. And so far this morning we've had found a little bit of a support close to pivot uh, in the crude contract. In terms of the calendar for today, just to wrap things up, the morning fairly quiet. There's nothing much else to look out for. Uh, you've got the Indian rate decision. That's very much specific for the rupee currency rather than the broader market. Uh, Eurozone GDP, uh, again, kind of Q1 data is fairly old. That's probably not going to have much uh, reaction on European assets short term. And in the afternoon, you'll see a distinct lack of real economic data coming out of the US really it's just the oil inventory numbers at 3.30 so as was the case on Monday Tuesday today possibly the same if not even to a greater extent we're getting so close now to uh, the kind of peak of interest of where traders and volume will be focused on Thursday session today could also be equally quite quiet like we've seen throughout the beginning first half of the week that being said then I'd be identifying technical levels potentially with a little bit more kind of gravitas or because the market might just define a certain range and stick to that with the lack of kind of participation overall on the volume basis okay guys that's your briefing for this morning uh, any questions as usual just feel free to post them in the chat room happy to help otherwise uh, enjoy your day and good luck out there <laughs>